uh, welcome to Winter Grand Rounds. Uh, very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Kyle Miller, Professor of Molecular Biosciences at UT Austin. Uh, Dr. Miller uh, completed his uh, PhD at UC London and lab with Julia Cooper studying telomeres and yeast, uh, followed by a very brief stint, uh, Dr. Todzitsky's lab at uh, UCSF studying chromatin and yeast. Um, and then he completed his, his postdoctoral work uh, lab of uh, Steve Jackson at University of Cambridge, uh, completed some really, really nice work, uh, history modifications and, and regulating DNA dam response. And uh, since 2011, he's been a, uh, a faculty member at UT Austin. Uh, he's risen all the way up to the rank of full professor, uh, currently funded by two R01s and two CPER grants, and has done some really, really nice work, published in Cell, Molecular Cell, Cell Reports, uh, Nature uh, Genetics, Genes Development, and uh, served on Cancer EDLA study section and ad hoc now with me on RTB study section. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Miller. Great, thank you very much for the introduction, David. Uh, thank you everyone who uh, is here and also online. And it's really a pleasure to tell you today about uh, the work in my lab trying to identify epigenetic mechanisms involved in genome integrity pathways and thinking about how this might provide new ideas for therapeutic opportunities uh, in cancer. And so I just want to start this morning by uh, reminding uh, all of us that DNA is actually very reactive. Uh, it's constantly undergoing various different uh, lesions uh, in our cells. And here's just some estimates from a very nice review from Andre Nussenzweig's lab showing that endogenous DNA damage levels, you know, they're quite prevalent uh, in cells. And this, there's a host of lesions that occur um, from base changes, um, oxidated um, nucleotides, as well as single strand breaks. And what my lab is uh, mainly focused on, which is double strand breaks. And so during this discussion this morning, uh, it's estimated that each one of your, you know, trillions of cells will have over 2,000 DNA lesions. And so it's really lucky for us that we have very efficient repair pathways that most of the time deal with all of these with no effects on the cell. But of course, this uh, doesn't always work, and this can lead to, to mutagenesis and ultimately um, to human diseases. And so we can see these byproducts of these uh, and this connection with genome integrity and loss of this integrity in cancer. And if uh, you can see that at the chromosome level, if you look at karyotypes uh, of tumors, you can see um, large amounts of genome instability, uh, aneuploidy, translocations, chromosome loss, and so forth. There's also uh, very focal changes to the genome that occur, such as copy number variations that occur at specific regions, and you can think often these are where oncogenes uh, exist to be amplified. And with the advent of next generation sequencing, we know from now uh, sequencing of now millions of tumors that there are very large amounts of mutations that occur in, at different rates uh, in different cancers. And so for some of these with very high rates, such as melanoma, lung cancer, you know, we know the sources of, of these. But for many of these diseases, we don't really know where all of these endogenous DNA damage lesions are coming from. So I think there's a large question in the field is what's really generating these mutations? And so we made a little bit of inroad into this in a, in a large study that we published several years ago now um, in collaboration with Susan Rosenberg's lab at Baylor College of Medicine, where we identified a conserved network of proteins from bacteria to human that actually, when dysregulated, promotes uh, mutagenesis. And this was done by two very talented uh, graduate students, both in Susan and my lab. And this uh, was very exciting that we have identified our own proteins that can change and become mutagens. And so we're very interested in studying these pathways. And the uh, part of my lab is focusing on this. And so what's the connection then thinking about DNA damage and cancer? I think it's a very interesting relationship. And on the one hand, as I just mentioned, DNA damage, and I'm just showing double strand breaks here within chromatin, which I'm gonna talk quite a bit about today. This leads to one of the hallmarks, which is genome instability and mutation. And one thing that this hallmark does, is kind of an enabling hallmark for all the others, which are driven by mutations and pathways that drive these various different um, pathways that are dysregulated in cancer. And so when I'm teaching, I always you know, tell students, I consider this kind of bad DNA damage. Now, as this audience knows even better than me, 
we actually harness uh, compounds and treatments that create DNA damage to actually target cancer cells, such as radiation therapy, that this is one of the lesions that it creates. So on this side of it, this is kind of good DNA damage. We can use that to target cancer cells. So there's this relationship uh, that I think is very interesting between mutations that drive cancer and treatments that target uh, these mutations and these vulnerabilities that exist because of these uh, mutations. But I'd like to put another layer of, uh, on top of this by what is the uh, impact of epigenetics on these pathways, which I think is less well understood and something that I've been studying for quite a while now. And so I'd like to introduce, you know, what is chromatin and why do we think it's, it's so important? And so our genome is organized by chromatin. So this little ball here is a nucleosome made up of histone proteins. And in each one of your cells, you have about two meters of DNA. And that DNA needs to be compacted into the limited volume of the nucleus. And chromatin does this compaction in higher order folding. And by doing so, it really regulates the accessibility to DNA for any process. And this includes transcription, replication, and DNA repair, which we now know are very highly related with each other. We have one genome, it does many functions. These need to all be coordinated. And so how does chromatin work? I mentioned this nucleosome. Nucleosomes are known to be highly modified by uh, chemical and protein modifications, histone post-translational modifications. These are regulated by enzymes that can dynamically write and erase these marks, as well as effector proteins that recognize these signals to get recruited to chromatin to exert their function. And I'm gonna tell you quite a bit about those today. There's also variants, very complex, uh, beyond just normal histones, such as these H2A variants here that play uh, specific roles in the genome, as well as large chromatin remodeling complexes made up of many proteins that take these nucleosomes, slide or evict them to regulate accessibility to our genetic information. All of these collectively work to regulate chromatin structure and function. And so what happens when you have DNA damage, either from endogenous sources or exogenous radiation and so forth, you create DNA damage. This is sent by very large uh, and complex pathways in the cell that recognize this damage and ultimately lead to activation of repair pathways that can fix this break, either using a homologous uh, template, such as during homologous recombination, or just stitching this back together in a non-templated reaction, which is this non-homologous end joining pathway. It also links in with the cell cycle through checkpoint uh, activation. You can think of P53 and G1 arrest as DNA damage. It also affects chromatin. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about its role in transcription when you have DNA damage. And ultimately, these pathways regulate cell fate decisions, such as apoptosis and senescence, which are really important for removing cells from our bodies that have DNA damage. And we know that many of these pathways are mutating cancer so that they ignore this so that those cells can survive. So why are these important? Ultimately, these protect our genetic material from mutations and stability. Through these cell fate decisions, they act as anti-cancer barriers, and a lot of work and our understanding of these have come from the fact that you can identify mutations in these pathways uh, in um, patients. And also, as I mentioned, many anti-cancer drugs actually function through this pathway by creating DNA damage or affecting them. And so in cancer, we know that these pathways often become mutated and lost. This sets up this cycle of genome instability and changes, which allows the cancer to evolve to different treatments and changes, resistance, and so forth. And so it's really after cancer cells have uh, mutated these pathways, this leads to the vulnerability of these cells then to additional DNA damage. So on one hand, they mutate to get more mutations, but now they can't handle DNA damage because they have defective uh, pathways. And so where does chromatin come into here? If we look at uh, human cells that have been irradiated, actually within seconds, you can see using an antibody to a histone variant phosphorylation, you see these dots that are occurring. And each of these dots represents regions of the genome that have a DNA lesion. And within these lesions is where this DNA damage response uh, transactions are occurring. And so we have a normal chromatin state. They're set up with these marks 
that tell that genome, okay, transcribe this gene, repress this gene, replicate, so forth. When you have DNA damage, this is remodeled by changing the chromatin through an activation of these enzymes through these chemical marks uh, and protein marks, such as phosphorylation, which I show here, acetylation, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about today, and, and others. And these enzymes then allow all of the changes and processes that occur that allow repair of this uh, break and then resumption of normal chromatin states. And so you have both the genetic information, but you also have the epigenome information that needs to be returned so that that uh, genetic loci returns to its normal function. So we have to also think not only genome integrity, but also epigenome uh, integrity. And so this is a lot, I'm not gonna go into much detail, but I just want to kind of point to one example of this, which is the, in the context of gene transcription. So if you have an active gene, you have these enzymes that make the transcripts, there's modifications that promote the activation of these genes. And when you have DNA damage, a host of labs, including ours, have identified multiple pathways that really collectively remodel this chromatin to shut down transcription and allow this break uh, to be processed and repaired. And I kind of think of this as an analogy, this you know, DNA is kind of a molecular highway. You have all these activities happening, you have all these proteins. But when you have a, an accident, such as DNA damage, for example, you know, that stops everything. And until you resolve this, you can't really get back to your normal, you know, way to get to work or, or so forth. And so this is exactly what happens in cells. These pathways stop transcription. They remodel this so that it promotes repair of this through these pathways uh, so that you can fix this and then resume transcribing that gene without any uh, mutation where that DNA lesion occurred. So our contribution to these pathways is we've identified this pathway uh, is shown in the box here through these various different um, papers. And we've identified in a, a PARP, which is polyADP ribose enzyme, uh, which a lot of people are studying. It's very interesting that PARP inhibitors are used to treat uh, HR deficient uh, tumors, especially BRCA1, BRCA2, um, breast and, prop, uh, and ovarian cancers. So through a PARP dependent pathway, it recruits an enzyme uh, called cadmium 5 which is a demethylase that removes one of these histone modifications, which recruits a chromatin remodeling complex to remodel this uh, chromatin to ultimately repress and repair these breaks. I'm gonna tell you just briefly a little bit about that. And so it's known for a very long time, uh, Steve Ellich first published this uh, over a decade ago, that PARP was responsible for uh, repressing transcription after DNA damage. We've identified these new uh, enzymes. I just wanna give a little bit of what that looks like um, from a data point of view. So we can actually have a nice assay to look at nascent transcription. And so if you pulse human cells with 5EU, so this is a uracil um, analog that's fluorescent, you can see nascent transcription. And if you create DNA damage, and here we're using a laser that you can just draw across the cell to damage, you actually see gamma h 2 is DNA damage. So you mark where you have this line, and you can actually see a black line across where you've created DNA damage. So you have local transcriptional repression at sites of DNA damage. And if you deplete KDM5A using uh, RNAi here, we're using siRNAs in this case, you actually lose that black line. So you're no longer able to locally repress that transcription. And here we're using, again, laser microradiation, GFP tag KDM5, we can look at its localization. If we create DNA damage where the circle is, it gets accumulated at those sites in a PARP-dependent manner. So this got us very interested in thinking about, okay, what's the mechanism here? How does KDM5A, the C-methylase, use PARP to regulate this pathway? And so KDM5A, what is it? So this is its domain structure. It sits in a family with uh, four proteins, the screen show here. One is uh, um, uh, on the Y chromosome, KDM5B, which I'm not showing here. It has a lot of domains, many of these THD domains that bind chromatin or histone modifications. And no known parlation sites or par binding regions were known for this family. And KDM pipes are involved in DNA damage responses. We've published that in others. And they're also uh, very interesting as therapeutic targets. 
targets because they're overexpressing several cancers, uh, especially in breast cancer. And so there's been a lot of work to try to find KDM5 uh, family inhibitors uh, as a therapeutic uh, in these cancers that overexpress these uh, enzymes. And so this is just one piece of data. We purified these proteins. We put it on a membrane that contains poly ADP ribose chains, and we can see that KDM5 specifically binds to these uh, PAR chains, whereas the other members don't. So we're interested, okay, can we identify how this is actually binding to PAR chains? And so we took a biochemical approach. Um, no one has ever purified full length KDM5A. I would love to find somebody who actually did that to do um, other studies, but it's quite a large protein, difficult to work with. So we chopped it up into these pieces and we did these PAR binding domains and we found nice PAR binding, the strongest in this F8 region here, which includes this PHD3 domain, which actually binds to its histone modification, this um, trimethylation on H3K4. And looking uh, in this region, there was nothing structurally that we could pull out except that in this region here on the C terminus, there's a very high probability that it has a domain, a predicted domain, which is called a coiled coil domain. And this coil coil domain, uh, interestingly, is predicted to exist in 10% of all proteins. So it's very abundant. And it's known to interact protein protein interactions, but never been uh, implicated in any kind of uh, PARP biology or PARP binding. And so if we made additional constructs and we got rid of the putative coil coil domain, we actually found that the PAR binding exists within the coil coil domain. So I think the implications of this is that there's probably a lot of biology that we're missing for these proteins that have coil coil domains that might actually function through binding to PAR, which is um, very challenging to think about mechanistically how that's actually working. But I think it's an important uh, finding that might expand uh, are thinking of how PARP inhibitors are actually working. And I'll give you an example of that. But just, you know, we I'm going to go over this briefly. We made a mutant without the coil coil domain. We show that it no longer uh, gets recruited to sites of DNA damage. So that makes sense. Uh, if you can't find PAR change, you're no longer recruited. Uh, that's quantification of that. If we look at sensitivity to radiation, if we knock out KDM5A, these cells are sensitive. If we put wild type back in, we can rescue that sensitivity, but not with a delta um, PAR interaction domain. So it's functionally important for radiation responses. And then also we use the CRISPR uh, technique to look at um, homologous recombination repair directly uh, with the same results. So this domain and this PAR binding is really essential for this enzyme to promote um, these repair pathways. And so we published this uh, a few years ago and we're kind of following up on it, but it, it leads to the idea that maybe all these uh, other drugs that people are making for KDM5A, could we actually think about using PARP inhibitors to target KDM5A? And so, as I mentioned, PARP inhibitors are FDA approved for HR deficient tumors, but this data get, kind of gives the rationale that we should look at maybe targeting KDM5A driven cancers using PARP inhibitors. So I'm just gonna briefly show some unpublished data where we've seen that derepression in KDM5A knockout cells that ECAT here and very important um, cancer gene. Similarly, is derepressed if you use PARP inhibitors. And then just using a simple wound healing assay, looking at cell migration, we see that if you use PARP inhibitors, you uh, inhibit cell migration. If you have KDM5A knockout cells, you also uh, inhibit this ability to migrate, which is correlated with uh, met metastases. And then if you use both of them, they're epistatic, suggesting that they're functioning in the same pathway. So just thinking about how KDM5A interacts with chromatin in this review we wrote here, this new coil coil domain interacts with PAR chains. And we're very excited by this uh, data to think about kind of supporting the rationale for testing PARP inhibitors uh, in these pathways. And there's a lot of people looking for new biomarkers for PARP inhibitor responses because over 50% of responses, they don't really know why they work. They're not BRCA deficient cells. They're not even HR deficient cells. So people don't know what how these drugs are working. So we're currently working on this 
and testing our, our hypothesis. So that's one thing we're quite excited about. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears completely and tell you a completely unpublished and actually unfunded story. Hopefully we'll change that soon about our uh, study of these bromodomain proteins. So what is a bromodomain protein? It's a protein that has a bromodomain which binds to acetylated lysine. So it's one of these effector proteins. And us and others have shown that these proteins play very important roles in double strand break repair, uh, in transcription, also in tumor genesis and therapeutic responses. So here's the 42 human bromodomain proteins. Uh, in these papers, we've done several screens looking at the function of these in these pathways, both their recruitment uh, and um, their role in double strand break repair. But I just point out here that there's a lot of work on the therapeutic side, making small molecule inhibitors to inhibit these proteins with no real understanding of how these are working at the level of these repair pathways that we've been studying. So this kind of motivates some of our work to think about using these inhibitors in this context. So we set out, uh, we've studied a little bit of replication, but uh, mostly transcription and double strand breaks. So we set out to try to comprehensively analyze these proteins and their role in replication. And this is also uh, motivated by the fact that replication is a process by which it's difficult for cells. There's a lot of obstacles, and this is considered one of the major sources of endogenous DNA damage. So we think that chromatin might also impact mutagenesis through replicative processes. That's one uh, reason. The other is that these replication stress response pathways, and the details are not important, but they activate another uh, pathway to deal with replication stress. And these uh, people are very excited by new inhibitors including ATR inhibitors that are targeting replication stress in cancer. So these have progressed all the way into clinical trials and beyond just PARP inhibitors, people are using these replication stress uh, response inhibitors uh, in a therapeutic manner. But the epigenetic mechanisms in these pathways are still really poorly defined. So we thought we could make some inroads here um, by looking at bromodomain protein. So how are we going to do that? We wanted to develop a new system to look at proteins that associate with damage replication fork. And so we were inspired by the field that uses this system, which I'll explain here, where cells contain a large uh, array of the LAC operator. If you think way back to your uh, genetics in bacteria, LAC operator is bound by a LAC repressor. And so what happens if you express this in cells is it binds to these 256 copies of this sequence, and this completely blocks replication. So cells cannot replicate through this block, and it's a site-specific replication block. So we made a version of this where we removed uh, this fluorescent protein, and we put an enzyme called BUR-A, which is an enzyme that's able to ligate biotin onto proteins uh, in a site-specific manner, in a proximity-specific uh, manner. And so when you have this replication block and this enzyme located here, it actually is modifying every protein in that space. And we can then, by this modification, we can pull that down and identify those proteins using mass spectrometry. So if you look in cells, we can identify this lac repressor BUR-A protein. And in this reaction with biotin, which is a, a vitamin that you can see through um, uh, streptavidin, you actually see that you can biotinylate specifically only that site in the genome. So then we can just purify that and say, okay, what proteins are localized in that space? So we've done this. Uh, we call this technique block ID. There's the acronym there. And Interestingly, we identified 22 bromodomain proteins that were enriched at this blocked replication fork, uh, doing many, many controls like non-replicating cells and, um, and so forth. And so we were very interested in these proteins and studying this. And I'm going to tell you just about one of them, um, which is called TRIM24, which at the time, it's really, and still, it's, it's uncharacterized in these responses. So what is TRIM24? It's part of this very large family of proteins uh, that at its interminate have these conserved regions that are a ring domain and these zinc fingers and coral coral domains. 
And these are enzymes that can put on different modifications, including ubiquitin and sumo. And I'm not going to go into any of the details there. But trim 24 uh, in cancer is, is actually pretty well studied. It's a transcriptional regulator of P53, androgen receptor, estrogen receptor. And there's some very nice papers that have linked it to various different cancers through its transcriptional role, both in breast and prostate cancer. But in replication stress, really uh, unknown. And so this is the domain structure of TRIM24. It has the ring domain. It has the bromo domain, which I introduced, and a PhD domain, which is a, another chromatin binding domain. And so if we look at these, we've deleted these domains, and we actually see using the same LAC-R system, you see this dot here. That's where the replication block is. TRIM24, GFP tag, so it gets recruited. You can see that. If you delete the ring domain, no effect. If you delete these C-terminal uh, histone modification binding domains, it no longer binds. So this really instantly told us there must be an acetylation pathway regulating this protein. And so we then again turn to BioID um, because we wanted to figure out what proteins TRIM24 is working with. And interestingly, TRIM24 has really only been studied uh, in transcription. But most of the proteins we identified actually were in nuclear uh, bodies and also in heterochromatin places such as telomeres, centromeres, chemo bodies, and so forth, suggesting it plays an entirely different role that it was uncharacterized before. And here's just some of the enrichment proteins that we identified in these pathways. And given my background in telomeres, I was really interested in looking at that. And these are just some other repair proteins that we identified that were enriched that you know, kind of gave the rationale for looking at this protein in uh, replication stress, including telomeres. And so you probably all know that telomeres represent the ends of our chromosomes. Uh, in cancer, uh, in most of our cells, these telomeres shorten, and then those cells are removed once uh, the age of the cell has gotten to a, a certain a set point. But in cancer, they reactivate, 85% of cancers reactivate telomerase. And so they extend telomeres to give them this unlimited proliferative ability uh, to grow. But in 15% of cancers, you actually don't reactivate telomerase. And instead, it's driven by a replication stress-related process where you use um, strand evasion into another chromosome to copy this in a break-induced replication type pathway. So this was very similar to replication stress and this replication block where we identified TRIM24. And just to tell you, this 15%, it's not equally distributed across cancers. It's actually all cancers show higher frequencies in sarcomas, gliomas, and also pediatric neuroblastomas. People don't understand exactly why that is. But um, for some reason, these cancers particularly are susceptible to maintaining their telomeres through this ALT pathway. And so, as I mentioned, chromosomes, after every cell division, their telomeres shorten. And normally, these cell fate decisions get rid of these cells. But cells can go through a process called crisis, which leads to very large levels of genome instability. And out of that genome instability, these cells evolve reactivation of telomeres, either through telomerase or ALT. And this is why enabling replicative immortality is essential uh, for tumor genesis, and it represents one of the major hallmarks. Okay, so PML bodies, uh, the details aren't important, but these are sites where the synthesis of telomeres and ALT actually occur. So they have these bodies that you can look at with a PML antibody. TRF2 marks telomeres. It's a protein that binds the T2AG3 repeats in the telomere. And if you look at these in these all positive osteosarcoma cells, they have some of the telomeres co-localized with PML. And these are the ones that are undergoing telomere synthesis. It's not all of them PML bodies do other things, but this is where telomeres, they go, they cluster and they get synthesized. So we can use PML as a readout for alt activity. And what's actually happening molecularly in here, I know this is a lot of details, but just briefly, Replication stress occurs in telomeres. This activates a pathway that leads these telomere ends to go to PML bodies 
This is a liquid liquid phase separation. We won't get into that. But this is where these recombination replication pathways occur that extend the telomeres so that these chromosomes um, don't shorten and these cells um, can keep growing uh, infinitely. And so our question here then, is TRIM24 involved in ALT? So I teamed up with a friend of mine uh, who's an ALT specialist, Radio Sullivan, and it's postdoc Rajini at University of Pittsburgh. And we set out to test this idea based on the results I just showed you. And for this, we used telomere specific targeting uh, constructs to look specifically at telomeres. And the way we do that is that I already mentioned biotinylation is the sheltering complex is the six protein complex that binds to telomeres. And there's a construct where one of the bind, double strand binding proteins, TRF1, is fused with turbo ID. So you can uh, analyze all telomere associated proteins. And there's also another version of this where it has a nucleate which can cleave DNA and create site-specific DNA damage. So if we look at telomere-specific proteins, we can identify TRIM24, saying that TRIM24 is localized to telomeres through that uh, result. And then if we express a TRF1, FOC1 nuclease, which is creating breaks only at telomeres, you see that TRIM24, and this is endogenous antibody, endogenous levels, you see that these foci occur, which co-localize where telomeric damage exists. And if you have an enzyme dead TRF1, FOC1, then you don't get localization. So again, taking these together, TRIM24 localizes to these damaged telomeres. Another thing looking at, these are chromosome spreads, looking at the reactions that actually occur at telomeric ends, we can do that using these fish assays. And you can actually use strand-specific um, probes to look at both leading and lagging strand telomeres. And so this is a metaphase chromosome. It has you know, cis two sister chromatids, and then it has four telomeric ends. And what happens in all cells is you get recombination between these where they exchange that information, and you can follow that by the change of color. And so if we look in TRIM24 deficient cells, these recombination events are reduced. And you can also score telomere-free ends because they won't have these signals. And TRIM24 deficient cells have an increase in telomere loss. So this was really screaming, TRIM24 is very important for telomeric uh, reaction. And so we were curious to see, is that involving acetylation? So here's the same assay. We see localization. Uh, this is now GFP tag TRIM24. You see it localizes the sites of telomeric damage. If we use our same mutants that I already introduced to you, we see that this also requires the PhD and Bromo domain to be recruited uh, to those sites. So again, this is an acetylation-dependent pathway. Acetylation has never been linked with all telomeres before, so we're quite excited about that. And so to set up a hypothesis that these enzymes that regulate acetylation are being activated at telomeres to promote TRIM24 to facilitate these ALT reactions. So uh, I'm summarizing a lot of work here. We actually looked um, and knocked down every human hat, which is around 18 of those. And we identified two histone acetyltransferases called P300 and CBT, that when we depleted them, they block our uh, TRIM24 is no longer localizing to telomeric damage. So we identified the hats, which is P300 CBP. And consistent with that, if we use antibodies to CBP and P300 using our same assay, CBP and P300 are both recruited to telomeric damage. So they're not only required, they're actually going to those sites. So that gives us some confidence that they're acting uh, at telomeres. And now interestingly, uh, inhibitors are being evaluated to inhibit uh, these hats. One of them, a uh, very nice Nature paper, published this inhibitor, A485, which is a competitive inhibitor of CBP P300. So if we use this inhibitor, we actually see that this completely abolishes the ability of TRIM24 to go to uh, sites of uh, telomeric damage. And for the specialists in the audience, we've actually identified, we believe, the histone modification uh, which I'm not going to go into details, H3K23 acetylation, which is the actual mark that uh, TRIM24 is recognizing. We can see that that occurs 
at these sites. And we have some other data um, to suggest that that's the histone modification that's mediating this response. So now we're at the state where if we use this HAP inhibitor, we can block this, which inhibits TRIM24. But this, still the question is, can we block ALT uh, in these cancer cells? So we looked in several different ways. I'm just going to show you three pieces of data that look at kind of hallmark activities of ALT. And this, the details aren't that expensive, uh, important, but we can look at telomere synthesis by the incorporation of this uh, nucleotide EDU that occurs in G2 cells. This is, we can actually see where telomeric synthesis is happening. We can also look at PML body localization, which is where the synthesis occurs. And then all cells, uh, they have this recombination event, but they have a lot of single-stranded DNA. So we can use FISH to look at specifically single-stranded telomeric DNA. So in our first assay, uh, these are quite challenging. These were done by Roddy's lab. We can see these foci again of where EDU is being incorporated in these G2, G2 cells where you have telomeric damage. There's a large reduction in the ability to synthesize telomeres when you deplete TRIM24. That's consistent with it being required for all. If we look at PML localization to telomeres, these proteins marking telomeres, you see a lot of yellow here, co-localizing with PML. This is dependent on TRIM24. These are two different independent siRNAs that are depleting TRIM24. And then finally, we're using fish probes to look at single-stranded telomeric DNA, which there's large amounts of that in all cells. If we deplete TRIM24, now we're doing it with an SAs and different type of RNAi reagents. You pretty much abolish single-stranded DNA. And then importantly, we can rescue alt activity by re-expressing TRIM24 into these cells, saying that this knockdown is specific uh, and direct for TRIM24. So taking these all, all together, this really suggests that TRIM24 is really a bona fide alt promoting factor. Okay, just a few other, I'm finishing up here, just a few other pieces of data, kind of the ultimate way to look at this, uh, which is not easy, is to look at telomeric length. So in all cells, they have very large telomeres, over 50 kV, very heterogeneous because they're dealing with uh, recombination. These are uh, radioactive probes that can uh, identify these through southern blotting. And if you deplete TRIM24, these are now three independent SHRNAs, you drastically reduce telomere length, which is very uh, uh, consistent with our results and the role of TRIM24 in this pathway. And again, we can rescue that, this telomere length effect, if we re-express TRIM24. And we've looked at multiple cell lines. Here's the isogenic cell line that's all negative, all positive. Here you see the single-stranded DNA. If you deplete TRIM24, you abolish that. So it happens in multiple different independent alt uh, cell lines. And then importantly, if we deplete these histone acetyltransferases, we also abolish single-stranded DNA. So we think that's also abolished alt. And importantly, we get the same result when we use this inhibitor, suggesting that we've now identified a new inhibitor that can target alt activities in these cancers. And then this is my last data slide. Uh, you know, what's the mechanism you're probably asking? Uh, we've been asking this for a couple of years now. And we think we, we know how it's working. I'm just giving you one piece of data of how we, what we think is going on. And to do this, we took advantage of a few publications that had used a small DNA binding domain from fission yeast that binds to human telomeric DNA. And so we fused this to TRIM24 to force expression of TRIM24 telomeres. Now all TRIM24 is going to the telomeres. And so what happens if we look at so if you just use this TEB1 uh, DNA binding domain, you see PML bodies. They don't co-localize except for very few of these. And now quite drastic results. Um, if you look at TRIM24 TEB1, you see that now PML bodies are localizing to pretty much every single telomere. So we think that TRIM24 is very important for driving telomeres into PML bodies, which is where the sites of telomeric synthesis occurs. So we're figuring out the details here. We think there's uh, a lot of modifications that are occurring. We have mutants and so forth, and we're kind of figuring out the details. But we think that it's, this is really explaining why, if you don't have TRIM24, 
these telomeres are no longer going to sites of synthesis, which allows their telomeres to be shortened. So to summarize what I've told you this morning is we've created a, a new technique that we call block ID using proximity ligation to look at proteins associated with stress replication forks. We focused on one chromatin family. Uh, we can focus on many others. There's a lot of proteins in these data sets, bromodomain proteins, identifying 22 of them. Some uh, were identified in previous studies, but there's also some new factors here. And then I told you just about trim 24. And so our model at the time now is that through a histonacetyl transferase dependent histone modification pathway, that at replication stress at telomeres, this activates and recruits CBP P300 to acetylate chromatin. This recruits the effector protein TRIN24, which interacts with PML to drive telomere clustering and localization um, to sites where alt synthesis occurs. And these are required then for alternative lengthening of telomeres. And through using HAP inhibitors and potentially the loss of TRIM24, there's no specific TRIM24 inhibitor yet. You can actually use these to abolish this pathway and block uh, ALT from occurring. So we think this is uh, provides a therapeutic opportunity. And then I briefly told you our identification of this PARP-dependent pathway for KDM5A, thinking about how PARP inhibitors might be repurposed, actually, to target KDM5A drug.